welcome, Professor Robertson. It's nice to be here, though I think we'd all prefer not to have the epidemic and be spared the lecture. Uh, I think enduring an epidemic offers us a teaching moment, uh, always a good slogan. And I'm struck as today's physicians try to determine the working of the current COVID epidemic to determine how it is transferred or where it came from uh, at the numbing doubt of our ignorance of that such lack of knowledge imposes on us today. Uh, we are otherwise a privileged generation that's seen the near complete eradication of several of the diseases, including polio and smallpox, the afflicted earlier generations. We can even have the luxury of anti-vaxxers who disapprove of vaccines. Faced with a new pandemic, we certainly uh, want answers and certainty and, and are prepared to swallow the most amazing tales. Um, those tenacious young men in America who uh, listen to Mr. Trump and then lace their claws with beer to make it more palatable, perhaps only the most stubborn in pursuing a cure uh, when it was offered to them. Uh, don't try that at home. Um, uh, both the bubonic plague, uh, when, if we accept uh, the possible identification with the plague of Justinian in the 540s, uh, basically, bubonic plague hit Western Europe from plus or minus the 1340s up to around 1720. Uh, and then um, the cholera, which hit Europe at episodes through from the eight, um, 1830s through to the 1860s uh, and hit Jamaica in the 1850s. These diseases uh, all prompted plenty of incomprehension, as well as desperate efforts to make sense of what was going on. And I think I want to stress the degree that the answer was not obvious at the time. Who would expect that fleas for carried by rats would be a way of transferring the disease? That understanding of how bubonic plague worked wasn't worked out till the 1890s. Uh, and even then, you had a second uh, medium for translation if you can just get it someone puffs in your face as today. Um, if I can have my picture, please. It's a fairly treacly picture. Uh, it's from the Guildhall Art Gallery in London uh, called Saved from the Plague. Um, is it coming up? Can it come up? It's... Okay, it's a, it's a weird picture that you can see when you go to London. Uh, I'm not sure it will be the pivot point for your visit, but it shows uh, people in remarkably clean 17th century costumes outside beautifully posed uh, buildings and, and props. I think I can recognize where the wooden background's from. And the, the street, which is wonderfully clean cobbles, there's somebody's slumped rather artistically dead up against the wall. And a man is reaching up to rescue a child. Oh, here we are, a rather ho-hum picture, if it's making it. Is it coming up on the screen for everybody? Uh, but we have this picture of a child being rescued. And there's a degree that perhaps now that Jamaica is going through quarantine itself, there won't be the same way of looking at it, the smugness, the, the delight in the detail and the cuteness uh, and the risk of quarantine breaking that made it seem sentimental and late Victorian and late Victorian and be bought by London's Guildhall Art Gallery uh, when it came out in the 1890s, early 20th century. Uh, in the at the time, uh, the way the epidemic was, was projected was through uh, big signs painted on the door, uh, a big cross, and then underneath, Lord have mercy upon us. And uh, once a, a death or a sickness was found in a household, the doors were barred, the church wardens were being food round, and nobody was allowed out until 40 days after the last person had died. Uh, so if you have another death after 39 days, you're stuck there for another 40, plus while uh, But there's a different way of doing quarantine. And what we see in this image, and also in our own society, are questions about how it spreads. This rescue, if we can have the picture back again, please, is not necessarily about hand washing or wearing masks. Personal protection gear was not such an issue. Uh, today, though, we work in a germ-based framework. 
and our visual imagination of this disease is not big red crosses painted on doors or kitty winks being rescued out the window, but is instead that amazing image uh, of the COVID um, germ uh, that's been brought up from electron microscopes and then colored in amazing colors. I'm not sure if it's on t-shirts yet, but it's a striking early, if you want an image to characterize 2020, the COVID germ uh, is probably one of them, uh, or microbe. And even as physicians try and comprehend how it operates and who is vulnerable in order to protect the vulnerable and uh, target its chain of transmission. And what's clear as we look at this now is people still don't know. Uh, and you can see as places like America or the UK or other places open up, how's the infection going to come back again? Will there be an uptick from the last two weeks of rioting and demonstrations in America leading to greater sickness of people being crowded together and shouting? It's going to be daunting to see what happens because we're not used to it. We don't know how it works. And what I want to say, if we look at past epidemics, we see that same uncertainty. In the early 19th, uh, early modern period, and then in the early 19th century, we also had very different ways of understanding how disease spreads. We mostly work within the germ theory, uh, and we can imagine part particles spreading from person to person. Is it on somebody's hands? Have we got Listerine to clean down surfaces? Are you wearing your mask? And so on. Uh, and the whole personal protective gear uh, confusion. In the earlier period, they have bad airs. And if you don't have a germ period, when you're in somewhere like Jamaica, where you've got mosquitoes carrying everything, one is carrying yellow fever, another may be carrying um, uh, other uh, a, a whole line of diseases coming in your window. So you close the windows, you have mosquito nets. There's a wonderful description of an English migrant coming out who can't get into bed because he can't understand how to undo the mosquito net and get into it. So he sleeps on the carpet or on the rug. But you've got this, this, this different way of setting up space and different ways of thinking about uh, disease and closing windows instead of fresh air. Um, and how disease is contracted. And I think we can see this in the autumn of 1665 in London, uh, the mayoral elections are in September. Uh, there was a, uh, 1665, the plague had been running all year and the mayor calls for mass bonfires. People are to bring out their furniture, their papers, all those inconvenient papers saying you're with Cromwell, bring them out, pile them in the street, and run bonfires for a whole week as they tried to change the microclimate of London so that the bad airs that had huddled over the city since the previous spring would dissipate. Uh, it didn't work because it wasn't bad airs, but it's interesting. Then again, in 1854, when um, cholera first arrives at Port Royal, brought, as we now know, in dirty laundry that had been carried from California back across the, 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 to, to, to Panama and taken to Jamaica, where there's really cheap washerwomen, uh, and they get infected by it the Admiral commanding sends the major warship out into Port Royal Harbor and has it fire broadsides of cannonballs over the top of Port Royal to try again and change that bad, noxious air that is holding the disease down over the town. And this vision of noxious air will then continue, and I don't know cholera that well, thank God, uh, in, in, in all of Jamaica. Uh, and there's discussions about the unevenness of its applicability between uh, African Jamaicans and white Jamaicans. Is, is it because the whites are prosperous or is it because the African Jamaicans are having their main meal in the evening and therefore there's not enough stomach acid in the morning uh, and for much of the day to dissolve the cholera uh, when it, it hits their stomachs. And again, I'm not enough of a medic. Go and ask your physician and do not try this at home. But we have, when it arrives in Spanish town, there, there's a senior physician in the town, believes it's bad air. He gets a kite, he puts a piece of raw steak 
stick on it. He pulls the kite and gets it to fly over the town and then pulls it down. And the raw steak is still red and bloody. It is not turned green and mildewy. So he says the airs are okay. The first per person who dies in Spanish town, he then takes to his surgery and dissects. And he's not working out how to clean his hands afterwards. The second person to die in Spanish town is the senior physician. Afterwards, they have a really well-intended uh, board of health, uh, and they set up a hospital. If you know Spanish town at all, um, there's a ford going down just by the water board. It's uh, the road that runs in front of the cathedral. That turns down to a ford, the old church ford. And just downstream, they make the hospital. So lots of people are going to be uh, uh, sick. There's going to be an awful lot of sewage going out of the window of that hospital. It's at that ford that the water cart for Spanish Town that arrives for all the subscribers uh, five days a week used to fill up. They'd pull the cart down in the, in, into the river and then fill up the buckets. So it's, oh, 12 foot upstream from the cholera hospital. Spanish Town has a worse death rate than London during the Black Death. This is, is not so healthy. And what I want to give us then is the difficulties of trying to adjust to new ways of thinking about disease, the difficulties of thinking about infection, the difficulties of thinking about vectors. Uh, so the final point, I think, is risk. And what comes with risk is death. And these are things that, luckily for us in the 21st century, we've got less used to. What the current epidemic brings us back to is the experiences of earlier generations that had to face epidemics. And they didn't just have to face epidemics, they had to face uncertainty about how a disease worked. And that's, as much as the epidemic, what can kill you. So let's hope the doctors can give good advice and don't try the various things I described to you yourselves because they won't do you any good. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Robertson, for an engaging presentation. It is now time for our wellness session, Keeping Sane with COVID Brain. I will now introduce today's facilitator. Mr. Fabian Thomas is currently an adjunct lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies, Faculty of Humanities and Education. A man of many talents, he's also a transformational trainer, facilitator, life corporate coach, poet, spoken word artist, actor, and published writer. He holds a BA in mass communication and literature from the University of the West Indies, Mona, and an MA in public communications from Fordham University in the United States. Welcome, Mr. Thomas. I look forward to hearing how to cope with COVID-19 on my mind. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Greetings and salutations, greetings and salutations. So COVID-19, unlike anything most of us have experienced, and it threw us into a tailspin. And one of the things that hit me very early on was the idea of multiple realities. People responded differently. There was no one norm. And I think I'm glad I adjusted to that early. And I realized that there was a little, people were a little kinder people were checking in on each other. And so one of the realities that hit me, the isolation didn't bother me because I was isolating anyway. I live a really solitary life. I live alone. I rarely have visitors. So that didn't bother me. What hit me was not being able to hug people. I'm very tactile. So I thought, wow, this is very unusual. And I thought other people are probably having different reactions to this epidemic to having to social distance. And so I became present to that. And that's an important thing for any of us going through any kind of crisis or forced change of reality. How am I doing? What am I feeling? And being able to name it. And there is no script. Don't make nobody make you feel bad because everybody is different. So some people didn't have a panic reaction until way later, that's fine. So be present with yourself. What's going on for me? What's coming up for me? How am I coping? What's in my reality? 
here's one of the interesting things about COVID-19 for me as well is the new idea of new norms. Plenty of our old norms weren't working. <laughs> so it was like, wow, this actually is interesting. So COVID-19 forced us to slow down. You know, sometimes a hamster on the wheel running fast and the wheel not going, in, but they're not going anywhere. A lot of us, our lives are like that. We're trying to pay our bills. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses, getting the kids to school. We have to hand in this paper. We were doing online courses and our life is like this. Slow down. And even now with COVID-19, be conscious of, you know, have downtime, breathe. I like to talk about taking time to smell and drink the brewed coffee and smell the roses. Some people rediscover their backyards. Re remember that they had a garden. <laughs> Some people also had to discover, why are you home? I don't like you. Why are you speaking to me? Why aren't you at school? So families had to reintroduce themselves to each other. Like we're all home together. How do we navigate this space? And so that idea of embracing this new idea of coping, what does conversation look like? How do we share space and not kill each other? How do we share space and be effective? Because mommy needs to have an online meeting. The kids are online at school. Daddy's doing something else. So this idea of learning how to, relearning how to share and navigate space, very important. Some things that we took for granted. I like to talk about inside and outside. Checking in with yourself. What's going on for me? So some days you're going to be fine. Other days you're going to feel overwhelmed and miserable. Don't want to get out of bed. If you can afford to stay in bed, do it. Pull the sheets over your head. Don't feel bad. Don't make anybody feel bad. There are some of these memes going around saying, if you're not learning something new in COVID-19, you're lazy. Mash down that lie. Leave people alone. Stop trying to prescribe to them how they should react and how they should feel. So be gentle with yourself. Check in on yourself. Also be conscious of staying inside. What does that mean for you? Feeling trapped. Some people went stir crazy. Cabin fever. I am being forced to stay inside. So my choice is being taken from you. Negotiating that. How do I feel about that? Outside now. How is what I'm feeling inside manifesting on my outside? Am I snapping at people? Am I irritable? You know, do I need to gauge that? You know, they say misery loves company. So how am I navigating what I'm feeling inside and how I'm showing up on the outside? The other part of outside for me is going outside. Like I mentioned earlier, some people discovered, oh my goodness, we have all this we have this walking space. There's a tree outside. There's shade outside. In the in the in the townhouse complex where I live, some of my fellow tenants here, people are outside on that little palm tree. We have studying or just laying down in the sun. So navigating that space. Don't be cooped up inside because you can actually get outside in your yard safely. Also, checking in and reaching out. Checking in with yourself but also checking in on other people. Some people felt overwhelmed and are feeling overwhelmed by media, Zoom meetings. Some companies went crazy. Everything is a Zoom meeting. Things that could have been conversations are now Zoom meetings. So check in on yourself. Do I feel overwhelmed? Call people. Pick up the phone and call people. WhatsApp somebody. Do a WhatsApp call just to say, how are you doing? Are you okay? But also now reaching out when you need help. Because some of us are, you know, the S is on our chest, even though it might be masked by our clothes. And we feel that we have to be okay. Or if you are the type of person like me that genuinely is fine, people tend to think that you're always fine. So sometimes if you don't say, I need some support, I need a listening ear, people won't know. So check in on yourself, check in on others, especially elderly, people who can't get out but also reach out when you need help and you need some assistance and things aren't going so great. The last thing I want to share is, and I became present to this early, is the possibilities and lessons that COVID-19 presented us. Thinking outside the box. In fact, what box? That's really the box. The box, the box mash up because we had no frame of reference for this. In the context of everything that feels out of control around you, 
What can you do? What can you take on? And start small. And maybe it is going outside. Maybe it is starting a little vegetable garden. Maybe it is for me, I found myself dusting off old projects. One of the first things I did is I had a dining room table that I had not used in three years, covered in paper and dust. So one Sunday, the straight up my mother took over and I cleaned off the table, dumped the stuff, and I created a workstation, which I would go and sit at. Then now I found myself on my laptop, old projects, things I not, were not finished. I had time to do that now. So navigate and find what can I do? When do I feel most like myself? How can I feel most productive? Don't follow anybody's script. Do your own thing as much as you can. Celebrate the victories and then challenge yourself. Say, okay, what does next week look like? What does tomorrow look like? But be conscious and be clear that you're going to get through this. It's not about being perfect. It's not about being on all the time. Be patient and gentle with yourself. And the last thing I'm going to say is, please let us leave some of the old crosses and baggage in, in pre-COVID. Let some people say, when we're back to normal, no. How is the new norm going to be even more effective, more productive, more powerful? I'm, I'm excited about the songs that are going to be written, that are being written out of plays, the books. Um, education should not go back to being the same. What lessons have we learned that we can take with us so we come out of this um, pandemic with our COVID brain, but it's COVID brain 2.0. Peace, love, and blessings. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. I Bye. certainly learned a thing or two. Now, what I'm going to be doing, I'll be taking your advice and leaving my crosses and baggage behind. Yes. You know, in, um, in post-COVID times. So, thank you so much. And I hope for viewers, you have learned a thing or two as well. Now, it's time to introduce our final speaker. Dr. Carl Watts is a lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology. His research interests include economic and business history of the Caribbean, sports history, and landscape history. Now to you, Dr. Watts. All right. Um, I will be presenting on some of the lessons that we could, uh, we could learn from COVID, um, from the Spanish influenza pandemic in Jamaica. So, well, while there, there has been significant amount, there has been a significant amount of information um, produced in, in historical terms by researchers of the 19th century on the color epidemic, and Professor Robertson covered that um, topic um, very well in his research, in his presentation a while ago. Um, I am looking primarily at the influences or the lessons or the effects or the ravages of the Spanish influenza pandemic um, that affected Jamaica and the wider Caribbean in 1918. The latter parts of 1918 headed into 1919. All right. So um, the Spanish influenza pandemic, 1918 to 1920 in terms of its the spike years or the peak years, well, as most of you know, um, because of COVID-19, most of us were drawn to the fact um, or um, became very attentive to this particular pandemic because of the similarities between the flu and the, or, the, or influenza and the coronavirus, right? And but the, the Spanish influenza pandemic, 1918 to 1920, is considered the most deadly um, since the Black Death of the 14th century. Um, it claimed 25 to 30 million lives, that is according to original statistics, but this has been a revised upwards to at least 50 million. It was a very virulent influenza strain, hence why it killed so many, especially in the age groups of 20 to 54. Um, most of us know about COVID as a disease that kills primarily the elderly or those with pre-existing conditions. And so many of the young people felt safe during COVID to an extent, um, especially in Jamaica here, we know about the the mortality rates in the likes of the United States and Italy and so on and Western Europe in general. But in that sense, the Spanish influenza pandemic or the Spanish influenza virus was somewhat different from COVID-19. Right? It was an influenza strain that's 
said to, it was said to have originated in the United States and then it spread to Europe, particularly France, during the final year of World War I or the Great War. And according to Alfred Crosby, um, this was a very significant event in terms of the shift, the, um, the All right, so we have uh, a slight um, problem, I think, uh, thanks to our internet service provider. Dr. Watts is off screen very briefly. Now, uh, I want to use this opportunity um, to just go over Dr. Robertson's presentation. Doc Dr. Robertson. Yes. What are some of the main um, lessons that we can learn from um, epidemics of the past and how can we apply them now? I think one answer is the physicians are doing their best, but they may not know the answers yet. Uh, don't expect them to be completely true. Secondly, and I was, was struck by the point Dr. Watts was making just before he, he was cut off by technology. Uh, about the questions of who's going to be exempt and who's not. During the first assault of the cholera in the 1830s, which fortunately for Jamaica didn't reach Jamaica, but hit uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, and North and South America, um, there was a degree of uncertainty about how it spread, and there was shame at the news. Did you want to admit that somebody had died? And so the other side of thinking they're people exempt are the people who therefore say, oh, I'm, I'm young and stupid, and therefore I don't need to take precautions. And in some ways, they're going to die of stupidity, if not youth. Uh, and you see the current occasions with the people who are getting sick, never mind spreading the disease. And this, the, 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 the danger of thinking, oh, I'm less liable, and yet you can be a carrier. Um, and we see the same problems with um, the plague when people didn't know how it spread. So the remedy offered was, let's all go in a religious procession and march down the street, uh, chanting, uh, flogging ourselves, um, and all crunch together. And then the thing that really, the other thing that, so if you have, didn't have fleas when you started the procession, you might well have them at the end. And conversely, um, I'm sure all the people who watch this, their families are wonderful and happy, so there are never any feuds in families, which is a great, great good fortune. But unfortunately, in other families are not so blessed. And there's nothing like the argument at the deathbed, who gets the silver? Who gets the china? Who's going to get the pig? And when you're leaning over to say, who's going to get it? If the person has plague and they gasp out, it's not you, uh, and you inhale at the wrong moment, cheer up, you're going to die really fast. Uh, because if you inhale it, then uh, the Black Death is pretty thorough. Of course, you won't have a bubo because you won't have been bitten by a flea, which is what makes it more inconvenient. And there's an awful increase of, on the list of people who die of suddenly as the explanation. But I think we have the problem of what do we do with the people who we don't know what they die of, the, the suddenlies? What do we do with the people who think they're exempt? I'm young, um, and so I'll die of stupidity instead. Will I pull anybody down with me? And we have those sorts of questions. Maybe in another 10 years, if someone's foolish enough to watch this show and sit through, they'll all collapse with a good laugh at how much we misunderstood the obvious way of curing it, because it's not obvious now. Uh, so there's a degree that we don't know, and we have to admit we don't know, and therefore have to be cautious. 
And, and as Fabian has said, we can make this an advantage by using the time when being being cautious and on our own to, to do something, uh, I know, finish that copy of Batman and Robin and the Four Villains of Doom that's been on your bookcase for a long time. Uh, I'm sorry, a book title I saw at Woolworths when I was seven and didn't have sixpence, so couldn't buy it. It's a wonderful title. I suspect the rest of the book was trash, but I never read it. But sort of the degree that, yes, we can use the time, we should use the opportunity. And in a LinkedIn world, when you have apps and telephones and the rest and email, we can try and keep contact and maybe we should rediscover letter writing. And let me hand back to you. All right, thank you very much, Professor Robertson. One of the things that um, came out of what you just stated though were the need for wills, the need for planning, because you never know when you're going to be next. And I think, you know, having done uh, European history, I recall the fright that often um, faced many people, faced the populace in general. And the fright was, you never know when you are going to get it. And for them, it was evil air, it was miasma. Now, the wealthy had their primogeniture, so you know that it was the eldest, and it would go to the next male, and the next male, and the next male. But uh, one of the things I want to speak about are wills. How do we make wills uh, um, a more cultural phenomenon, particularly in places in which we might not like um, having to look at um, death or focus on death. Huh? Here's where we should have had someone from the law school, but they're a different faculty. Um, yes, there is, I mean, at one level, when people are talking about what's going to happen to the government, don't forget all these death duties uh, that are going to come out of the epidemic is going to be a, a surge of income for the government. But now let me hand you back because Carl's here and he was in mid-speech and has ideas to circulate. Welcome back, Carl. <laughs> Sorry, uh, must have been up the poor cuts. Um, I took off my internet, so I apologize. Floor. Really apologize. So can I continue? Um, so. Yes, please. All right, let me get back. All right, what I, what I seen before, before I got caught was, uh, well, yeah, all right, let me just um, fast track. I was just talking about the Spanish flu and its, uh, its effects. Um, that's, my, that's my topic I'm discussing primarily how this pandemic, to what extent can we learn lessons from the pandemic? Um, Professor Robertson already covered the cholera epidemic and how that spread throughout Jamaica, um, especially as, after being introduced externally um, to our shores and so on and so on. But um, the Spanish flu was somewhat similar. It became, there is no record of the 1889 to 1890 Russian flu that reached our shores um, in Jamaica, but it did reach. Um, one of the reasons for this is that at the time, influenza was not considered a notifiable disease. All right, so what I was saying before I got caught was that um, the Spanish flu, um, it was, there were some similarities, but influenza is not the coronavirus, but there are some similarities in terms of the, the, respirator, the respiratory effects of the disease, right? Uh, so in terms of how we handle this particular um, epidemic, in, on our shores, uh, there are some similarities that we can draw from our COVID-19 response to the Spanish flu response. And when you do the research, you realize that the Spanish flu response um, did set the tone for how we, we would handle such an epidemic as COVID-19, right? Because of the similarities were so striking. All right, so what I've seen is that the Spanish flu um, is one of the most deadliest um, epidemics, especially since the Black Death of the 14th century. Um, by 1918, as Alfred Crosby notes, he was saying that by um, those in the medical profession who were serving in World War I, for instance, they were at a loss as to why this particular virus was killing people in droves. Why was it so virulent as a, as a flu, you know, or as a regular strain of influenza? 
Um, they were used to this, this communicable diseases such as smallpox, yellow fever, diphtheria, cholera, typhoid, malaria, and the likes, which had been effectively managed or remedied in the Western world by the time of the Spanish flu. So most people were at a loss as to how um, this particular strain of influenza was killing adults in the range from 20 to 50 years old with such rapidity, right? And established knowledge, as I said, I don't know if that was captured before I got caught, but I saying primarily that um, you know, it's normally um, the case that we expect that um, both the elderly and the um, are the ones normally most affected by these strains of influenza, especially when we're talking about mortality rates, right? Um, the morbidity rate also, as in the rate of infection and so on, um, that was actually very high. Um, as most of you know, that with COVID-19, we were also struck with the fact that this disease spread rapidly. Right, and this, it was the same, it was similar. It was a similar case with the Spanish flu during this time. All right, so based on the morbidity rate and the mortality rates, um, it would have been difficult to imagine that the Caribbean would have escaped such a scourge, right? And obviously it did not. Um, the only known word that we have of the Spanish influenza um, epidemic in Jamaica uh, and the wider Caribbean is by David Killinray, and he only focused on the British Caribbean, you know. Um, this is one of three articles that I'm working at in terms of expanding, expanding um, how we view how the, the, the disease itself left a legacy in, in the Jamaican society, particularly in the health sector, right? Did they learn their lessons from the cholera epidemic, especially when they're stressing sanitation and so on, the values of sanitation, how that could improve the standards of living? Um, so in, based on the mortality rates of the Spanish flu epidemic, here in our in Jamaica, one could imagine that they did not learn some of the lessons, especially the impact that such diseases have on the poor, these communicable diseases, right? Um, so quickly, I'm just summarize before I get into the lessons. Um, the Spanish flu affected four major territories in the Caribbean, or four territories in the Caribbean in particular. It affected many, but four in particular felt the effects seriously. Um, Puerto Rico, British Guyana, Jamaica, and British Honduras, or modern day Belize, right? It was estimated according to Killing Ray and various statistici statisticians that um, 100,000 people died in the Caribbean from the Spanish flu, um, 30,000 within the British Caribbean. The reported stats say that 6,300 um, deaths were recorded in British Guyana, Jamaica recorded 5,500, Belize 1,000, Trinidad 300 and so on, but these are largely considered underreported stats and this is normally, this is concurred um, by con contemporary observers of the time. So those reported stats are more likely double. Hence, Jamaica's death rate was more like 10,000. You can imagine the shock that we had in, you know, in, this, in this day and age um, when one person died on social media, when you know, one person died, it created a great sensation on Instagram or, or you know, all, well, social media in general, this guy. Right, it created this great sensation regarding death, you know, the mortality rate, you know, the morbidity rate. Everybody was closed, um, locked up inside and so on, grappling with the, the new digital economy that we're trying to implement or the government is trying to have implemented, uh, you know, working from home. You know, how effective can we be, you know, at social distance in these kind of issues? Right, so, yeah, but... When compared with the Spanish flu, the nine deaths that we have recorded so far um, pale in comparison, obviously, to um, 10,000. That is the estimate. And as reported, most people assume that most of the stats worldwide are underreported based on the available um, records at the time, right? And the fact that influenza was not a notifiable disease, it was only after 1918 that the the authorities, the colonial authorities, or the imperial authorities, considered influenza a notifiable disease. So, hence, why if another case of influenza would come on the scene again, they would immediately respond accordingly, and all the stats would reflect influenza. So, one of the reasons why deaths were underreported in Jamaica was that they would associate um, deaths, like for you know, due to other conditions such as pneumonia or or um, you know, dry cough or fever or something like that, but they never identified influenza. But going forward, that was one major lesson. All right, so um, I'm just going to go through quickly some of the lessons since I know I was cut. Uh, the first one 
Um, just like the cholera epidemic and similar to COVID-19, this is a disease that originated outside of Jamaica. Um, it was external. Um, the major concerns that we have with ships um, at the moment was is justifiable considering how these diseases are normally spread. Uh, and as Professor Robertson indicated regarding the cholera epidemic and, him, and similarly with the, the Spanish flu epidemic or the Spanish influenza epidemic, pandemic, um, it came via the ships because no, obviously no air, air travel is more of, is more of a big factor. Um, no, in terms of how people, you know, move around internationally, but back then ships were the primary means of travel. Hence why, so the disease spread primarily from Port Antonio, Portland, um, by, an, by an American shipping vessel that docked here in around, around eight, October 1918. Um, 17 people were infected at the time. Nobody really knew what it, what it was. Um, the only indicator was that um, they were significantly affected in terms of their breathing and so on. Especially, you know, um, it was identified by its attack on the lungs and hence why people were of the opinion that the Spanish flu had indeed arrived. Another ship docked in, another American vessel docked in Montego Bay and this um, contributed to the spread. But Port Antonio, Portland is considered the main, major um source or epicenter of the the pandemic before it spread throughout the island right so the concern that concerns that we have with ships right now as we speak is very similar to back then so the prevention and treatment me measures were somewhat similar this is lesson number two um i'm just saying these as lessons i mean it seems you know obvious now based on our responses um, but clearly there was a time when you know we had to find a, a, um, a way a way to contain the rapid spread of such a disease we didn't know to do it then but we had the, the body of knowledge by the time covid 19 struck so that's what i'm saying so some of these things might seem obvious all right so the prevention and treatment me measures were somewhat similar um i don't know if most of you follow social media like that you know the videos that have been cir were circulating at the time you know you must drink some very bitter um, medicines like vinegar and so on to, to 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 help out with the throat. You know, if you feel something coming on, and you know, you, you heard a meme about um, is that corona? You know, if you feel a tingling in your throat and something like that, and people start wondering, is that corona? And most people are saying to prevent those kind of things, you know, you must drink. I don't remember the the concoctions that they came up with, but some natural remedies that had to do with a lot of it had to do with vinegar. Some had to do with salt. I remember this doctor um, gained some um, 15 minutes of fame by talking about um, soaking masks in salt and something like that, right? So similarly, with the Spanish flu, um, you know, we had a lot of bitter medicines, you know, quinine from the Sincona tree. Um, one um, central medical officer in Kingston at, at the time, this is in October, in the early stages of the epidemic, he was saying one of his solutions was that you take small doses of bitter quinine if that's how it's pronounced, sorry. Right? And you wash out the, no the nostrils with a solution of common salt and water, a tea, a tea teaspoonful, sorry, to the pint, or a weak solution of Listerine and water, or a weak solution of perman permanganate of potassium in water. So these are very technical terms, or hydrogen peroxide in water. I know that hy hydrogen peroxide became a big thing during the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, epidemic when it reached our shores as well. Also, one key thing was to build up the immune system. Um, that is another measure that we were also informed of during the COVID-19 era where, um, we're, you know, we're told that we must build up our immune system. So that should help us to, you know, manage the disease if we should ever contract it, right? And just like with COVID-19, people were told to isolate at home, take some bed rest and move on. So, this, well, I have some photos up here um, that, that was taken, that were taken from the the daily cleaner, um, I've cropped some of them. Um, so you can see that um, these are some of the, so there are several, several advertisements in relation to, in relation to the, um, the treatment measures. So this one, obviously several of them had to do with, you know, building up your immune system. So you have gores here um, advertising Epsom salts in one pint of water, or you must eat fresh ripe fruits, these kind of things to prevent the Spanish influenza. Um, the next one you have um, food that you should take, um, you know, horlicks, malted milk, uh, these kind of things in terms of what the, 
the druggists were recommending, you know, for our pharmacists were recommending at the time. And, you know, most people, um, they, if they don't want to go to the doctor, they just check a pharmacist in case just to say, all right, well, you know, you can't prescribe, you can't tell me something I can't take for this or for that. So the druggists were very um, popular during this time as well. All right. So number three, the, that lesson was the symptoms were somewhat similar. We know that, as I said before, influenza is not a coronavirus, right? But there is a resp the respiratory effects were somewhat, somewhat similar. Um, some of the indicators that you had COVID-19 were somewhat similar to the indicators that you had Spanish flu at the time. Um, some of these were the difficulty in breathing, the pneumatic conditions that would have been produced by this strain of influenza that would have differentiated it somewhat from COVID-19. Um, because this particular strain of influenza did lead to pneumonia, hence why some of the stats were underreported because some of the deaths were attributed more to pneumonia. Um, a fever of 101 to 105 degrees, we can identify with that. Joint pains, maybe not so. Dry cough, sore throat, and there were cases of vomiting and diarrhea. In the early stages of COVID-19, some people are even speculating that if you, you know, you could, um, diarrhea, diarrhea was an indicator that you had COVID or that it was upon you. Or haunting in some way. All right, so quickly, number four, um, most of us can identify with the containment measures, quarantine, um, isolating yourself, and so on, especially if you have the disease. Um, at the time, large gatherings would have been disbanded, disbanded, sorry. Um, even the general penitentiary, the prisoners were relocated at some point. Churches, schools, shops, taverns, entertainment venues. Some were shut down in several parishes. Several events were postponed. I'm sure we can identify with that. Travel by railway was also restricted um, because it was a major means of transport at the time. We didn't have much vehicular traffic, um, motor vehicular traffic, that is. Um, sanitary workers were out in their numbers, fumigating the areas. Um, just like in terms of working conditions, several large companies, public bodies, um, operated with, with, with reduced staff. They didn't have Zoom at the time. And lastly, you are expected to wear masks or to use handkerchiefs when coughing or sneezing. And as most of you know, the reason why, to prevent droplets from being released into the air. All right. All right. So, but one thing to note is that several people floated these um, distancing measures or um, social distancing measures that we, um, you know, I, I mean, this, this is repeated even now. Right now, you know, we hear those people, um, we hear of those people disregard, we heard about the man who came and um, whose thing was publicized, the man from Arnie Gardens, you know, his video that circulated on social media when he was basically floating the quarantine rules and so on. So yes, it might have seen, oh, you know, uneducated or not sophisticated, doesn't really understand what's going on. But this is from an educated person, in, um, educated reporter from the Gleaner. A track meet was to be held at Kensington Park while the Spanish flu raged at the time. And his response was, there need be no fear of the flu at Kensington Park on Peacemakers Day. On the contrary, the well laid out grounds will be a haven from the attack of the dreaded malady. The pure sea breeze and the beautiful mountain view to say nothing of sweet music will render the flu a thing forgotten. Right? So yes, we can, you know, say what we want about um, that man from Arnett Gardens and how he should have been punished to the full extent of the law and so on. But, you know, even back then, some of the people who we expected to know better didn't. Right, so, and as uh, there's this photo up here, uh, most of you know that Palace Amusement is down. Uh, for many people, going to the cinemas is a big thing. But um, many of our movie theaters, our cinemas at the time, were open for business while the flu raged on. All right, so quickly. Um, just like in Jamaica, you know that we, during COVID-19, we had to rely a lot on um, support in terms of medical support. We're always trying to avoid overcrowding our public system, public health system. Because, you know, uh, you know, everybody was like, you know, we have to be very careful. We, don't, we can't, we don't have the staff um, sufficient to manage if the hospitals become overcrowded with victims. But we didn't learn that. Um, we must, I'm not saying we learned it from the Spanish flu episode, but they didn't learn it at the time because they didn't learn it at the time because, um, sorry, I got distracted. Right now. The hospital in Port Antonio did become overcrowded with victims and the shortage of Jamaica's medical staffs, both nurses and doctors, that became 
a significant issue and a major talking point going forward after COVID-19. So in further research, I'm expecting to highlight the extent to which they address um, this particular problem. Uh, the high incidence of infection among the, amongst the medical staff was also an issue, especially the nurses. Um, we had very few doctors on the island at the time and so on. Domestic food production, now, mostly talk about, talking about eat what we grow. COVID-19 also exposed those issues. I know in cultural studies, you have um, Dr. Ajamo Nangwai, who speaks a lot about eating what you grow and you know, uh, growing food crops in your backyard and so, so on and so forth. Um, because it's expect you know without food security, many people would feel the pinch of um, especially in an agricultural colony like Jamaica at the time. So it, dom domestic food production and security became an issue in the colony uh, because according to reports, many were afraid to leave their homes, and there were several ghost towns throughout Jamaica. All right, quickly, um, soon finish. So number seven, there is a social explosion by Christmas of 1918. Um, I, I, I myself didn't, I myself expected such a thing also after COVID and we've seen some of it, um, we've seen some of it to some extent as soon as the government um, started to lift some of those restrictions, I mean, you know, we saw recently with the beach how people started to flock the beach immediately. Um, as soon as the Spanish flu passed, there were several reports of people coming out in their droves and they're expecting people to stay locked up and so on, you know, expecting the people to be downpressed. But this wasn't the case. As soon as it was, as soon as the coast was clear, many people flocked outdoors. Um, quickly, let me read this quote from Saturday. Um, this is in relation to Christmas. You know, Christmas at the time was one of the big things. From from Saturday last, there was a marked increase in trade, and it continued right down to Christmas Eve. The dry goods establishment in the roaring business and the payment of the war bonus by the government and remitt remittances, which came to people here from their relatives, both in the United States and Cuba, greatly increased the circulation of money. On Christmas Eve night, there, there were hundreds of promenaders in King Street. It was one of the great, one great scene of gaiety and merrymaking, the blowing of fifis, the shrill sound of horns, the firing of torpedoes, and the throwing of confetti all added to the animation of the Christmas Eve festivity. And based on the, the state of downtown as we speak right now after COVID, I'm thinking that we are going to rebound in a similar fashion. All right, quickly, number eight. It, uh, socially, I mean, socially, I don't know what the economic cost is, but I know we do expect Jamaicans to flock the streets once more restrictions are lifted, especially when the dances and the parties seen um, open, so homes back up. All right, so number eight, quickly, last, second to last one, the majority of deaths were basically from 20 to 54. I mentioned that already. Uh, with the Spanish flu, um, it did kill many children. I remember when the girl who died, or, or the child, and I don't remember the gender, who died aged four, and her, um, that created a great, you know, a great jolt um, for the society. It circulated so much on social media. The emojis were out in, the, in abundance. Um, it's, you know, expressing their shock at this particular death. But the Spanish flu killed many children because of its association with pneumonia. And most of you know that pneumonia is still considered a major cause of child deaths internationally to this day, especially in the um, poorer countries of the world. All right, last one. One last one um, important lesson that we could take from the virulent experience. And like I said, these are lessons I expect to develop more, to research more. Um, obviously, I won't just focus primarily on the immediacy of the Spanish flu did pass quickly. Uh, what you need to know, October to December, it came like a hurricane, like a category five hurricane, and then it left and left its damage, right? Um, but did they, we really learn the experiences, but one important lesson, and this is similar to the cholera epidemic of the 1850s, was that the, the poor were significantly affected. So the lesson was what, what, what kind of um, approach could we take to creating a social net or safety net for the poor? Um, the living wage, obviously, at the time was considered too low to be self-sufficient self, self, self in times of scarcity. Um, they had to rely a lot on charity, especially with the Kingston Charitable Organization that increased, in, um, there was increased the number of soup kitchens at the time. Um, we know that in, during COVID-19, the government implemented the CARE initiative, um, people flocking the Western unions, because this is an... It, was, it has long been recognized that in these moments of crisis, especially uh, the poor are going to feel it, so they need some sort of social safety net. Uh, but at the time, there was no such thing as government care. 
or that we had that we have right now in terms of the distribution of checks for poor people. So what they're saying that in the long run, what, what we could do is um is encourage them to save, encourage the poor to save their whatever wages they would earn in friendly societies and other saving institutions. Um, not much was said about raising living wages and improving the standards of living, but based on the exploitative nature of the Jamaican colonial society, it would take the authorities a while to truly demonstrate that they had fully learned these lessons. And you know, we saw what happened in the 1930s and so on to address these low standards of living. All right, so that's it. For Thank you, Dr. Watts. I learned, I was here taking notes. My, look at this. I learned so much from your presentation. It was a highly informative. Now, okay. I'm speaking as somebody who did history in undergrad. I have my PhD in history. So clearly, you can tell I'm super duper impressed. So I learned quite a bit, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Now we're going to move into our question and answer session. Now I just want to remind um, our audience that uh, as I stated at the beginning of today's session, I will read selected questions from the chat to the presenters who will answer. We will have uh, three questions for each round in the interest of time. The question and answer session is uh, around 15 minutes. Now, I note here, because I'm here um, speaking with, with Michaela, our, who's moderating the chat, and Michaela said, we don't have any questions so far, but I have a lot, right? So I have, I have quite a few questions. The, the first thing, um, uh, Professor Robertson, I wanted to find out from you um, that issue of uh, the physician and how the physicians learned. How, how did, they, um, did they conduct research in those days? How did they um, do their research? So I'm very interested in knowing that. How did they learn about these diseases? And the, did, they, um, did what they learn inform how they handled, for example, the bubonic plague or cholera? That's one question. The other question is, um, I know that Mary C. Cole and her mother nursed quite a few cholera, um, cholera patients. So are there any lessons that we can learn from our own doctresses, not necessarily official physicians, but individuals who call themselves doctresses? What can we learn or what is there to learn from them? No, um, Carl, I, I learned, I had quite a bit. So this is my, I know, three questions per round. So one of the things I noted here um, were the home remedies, the building up of the immune system. And we're living in that time right now, and, and it ties into tomorrow's presentation, where there's a lot of information on social media. How... How did, in the past, how did they deal with some of this um, erroneous information? How did they deal with the um, plethora of information that um, was articulated verbally? And sometimes, you know, even in some of where people gathered, that some people felt immune um, from these diseases. So over to you, Dr. Robertson and then Dr. Watts. Professor um. Robertson and then Dr. Watts. You can see I taught you when you, I was still Dr. Robertson. Uh, so what we have is, I think, a question, and it covers a long period of time. The Black Death reaches Europe, plus or minus, uh, depending whether you're in Scotland or you're in Italy, uh, or in the late 1340s. And at that stage, we don't have much in the way of circulation of news. We don't have paper. Uh, it's still parchment. So at that stage, what you've got for the physicians is trying to fit the patients and piles of corpses out the window. And how do you fit this experience with what you learn at university or what you learn at school? And uh, there's a tendency, and of course it never happens today, for earlier academics to take the facts 
the uh, inconvenient facts they have in front of them, and then use a big mallet to try and make them fit their preconceived answers. And there's a degree that this, so that there were problems when if you don't have a plague like this, or you don't have a way of understanding it like this, how do you find answers? And in many cases, you die trying, and so do your patients. Uh, and I think this is where your second or, or question about the doctoresses is particularly important. Now, they're, they're because Mrs. Seacole and her mama produce lots of healthy drinks so that when the people were in a, a sick, they poured lots of liquids down their throats. And as people, I understand with cholera, my, it, my, I have a doctorate in history, do not come to me for medicine. Uh, but as I understand from cholera, basically you dehydrate yourself because, uh, uh, by, by just evacuating everything. If you can keep pouring liquids down their neck and if you can pour clean liquids, and so a pile of bush teas or strengthening broths were probably the best cure out there. But the physicians were using their textbooks. Uh, by the 19th century, there are medical journals. There's a short run of a Jamaican medical journal uh, at the National Library, which I haven't read. And clearly, it's at times like this. I'm aware that I haven't. I hope um, someone else who's good at the 19th century will rush down to the National Library. <laughs> and explore this resource. But what we've got is the sheer difficulty of fitting a new normal to our preconceptions. And we have the tension that in, in Jamaica, we see it exemplified by Mrs. Seacole, that here's somebody who's not an official medic, but she's experienced in therapeutics. And basically, her patients lived and the people with the learned and no doubt charging by the guinea doctors died. I hope they got their fees before they died. Uh, and we have this tension. Today, luckily, I think there's greater knowledge and there's some really silly cures going around. The other thing that we don't have uh, or we don't stress is how many silly cures were being circulated, uh, certainly for cholera. Uh, my guess is during the Black Death, let's go and murder the Jews. Let's go and, and murder the lepers. It must be lepers and Jews and outsiders who are the cure of it or the cause of it. And luckily, Jamaica is a place that hasn't had attacks on Jews. It's one of the many areas where Jamaica was more civilized than much of the rest of the globe. And there, are, there haven't been pogroms on Jews. But in other less fortunate places, they may yet have them. It's an easy, you know, outsiders. So I think the physicians have to be careful. They try and have it on one level to be flexible, to listen to ideas, to try and break their conventions. How is this different? How can we explore? How can we experiment? And you can hear, even coming over the everyday news for arts people like me, and I, 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 it's a long time since my best set, um, a level was in, in, in maths, or O levels in maths and chemistry. Uh, and I've been humanities all the way since. But how do you understand the data that's coming in? How do you put patterns to it? And that's been difficult with new diseases all the way through time. And then how do you, on the one level, look at people like Mrs. Seacole, who pulls off cures when the doctors don't? And can you recognize why she's doing it? And that's going to be difficult as well. Uh, and then the third thing, perhaps following up from Carl's point, what we've got now, it, where he was talking about quarantine and diseases arriving, is that what stopped the plague was having quarantine. And quarantine starts off as 40 days, so that people have, if there's been a death on the ship, the ship waits for 40 days till there are no more deaths. And the degree, what do you do with a disease that can either outlast quarantine or where people can walk down an airplane uh, gangway and see themselves as healthy and not get ill for another 10 days afterwards. And we have a set of tensions of how do we set up precautions now in a different world where we aren't using sailing boats or steamships and how do we make it work? I'll leave that one on. If that leaves answers for Carl to follow up with, uh, uh, with good sense.
All right. Thank you very much, Professor Roberts. Um, Carl, your turn. Well, the only thing I can say about that is that um, regarding the remedies and so on, and what you know, the experiences that we have had with COVID nineteen currently, when it comes, especially when we're talking about um, the natural remedies and so on. What I got from the research is that primarily most of the remedies that were being put out there were by established medical officers at the time, the use of quinine and salts and those kind of to take your rest, quarantine, all of those things were pushed primarily by the medical officers. I, do, I don't know if it's just a tradition now that we have inherited as, as soon as an epidemic of this proportion, like a COVID-19 comes along, respiratory in nature in terms of the effects and so on, that we decide that these are the natural go-to measures um, in terms of the salts and the, you know, the bitter medicines. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Watts. Mr. Thomas, I have a question for you. One of the things that um, has come up, I know you're not you know, necessarily a presenter, a presenter, but this is very important, mental health during this crisis. And one of the things that um, I've been reading about indicates that uh, the rate of depression has increased uh, during this, um, very, this period of isolation and par particularly for those without strong social networks. Mm -hmm. And the second thing um, attached to it um, that I also want to ask as well is that we have a lot of educators um, who during this time, they have to be, they have to be doing, playing multiple roles, educating via um, the, the phone. Some educators take, um, ride bicycles and bikes to get to their students. But in the midst of it, um, there, there, you know, education is about pouring yourself into your students. Mm. What can educators do to get something back in, to, to kind of restore the self? Because we all know that if you don't do that, you eventually would be pouring out of an empty cup. Right. And you touched on something very, very powerful and very important. And it, it, it comes back to that idea of multiple realities. So for some people, the COVID-19 restrictions and the isolation triggered either pre-existing things. So there are people who relapsed, you know, who were who had been sober, whether it's from alcohol or, or hard hardcore drugs, who relapsed because they needed something to soothe them. There are people who were stuck at home with an abuser. You know, so you, you can't leave the house, you're there, the abuser is there. And so I made some pointed things about posting resources, you know, hotlines for where people can call get some support, you know, and it, it was hard to go and stay with anybody else. So I think that level of, of, of our heightened sensitivity about people's situations is very important. And that same thing of doing what you can and what you could for yourself, but also other people. Um, I did a session, an online session for teachers at Charlemont High School, and we talked about that exact thing. A lot of them were exhausted. They were drained. Because as you said, some of them were going to kids' house. They were taking assignments to children who had no Wi-Fi. They were, then they had their own families. And I said to them, you have to pause and look after yourself. So one of the things I hope comes out of this, Nicola, change is better support for our teachers, you know, Ministry of Education, schools, because you are pouring out and it's, it's draining. You know, you stand in front of, some parents have said, I will never cuss another teacher. Because if this is one end of what teaching is, you know, for me to get my child to sit in front, uh, sit, sit in front of the laptop, you know, to follow up on homework, it's that support, it's that balance of people who are serving and giving and nurturing. What do you have in place for them? So I think there should be some institutional things, but also individuals being very care, careful about self-care, taking time off for yourself. You can't be there for everybody. It can't be on call 24 hours. You have to consciously say, I am doing these things for me. And it might be reading a book. It might be meditating. It might be taking up yoga. It might be walking. It might be sitting on that tree for half an hour and just listening to the birds. Powerful thing. Uh, several people said they became more aware of sounds in nature or in their yard because things were quiet because of the curfew. And a, a young man said, he said, I'm sure these birds have been in this tree from a movie here. 
But it's with COVID, it's the first time I've heard them sing in the morning. So because I was still, and it became his morning ritual, I mentor at Calabar, and one morning I said to the boys, just close your eyes, because they, they can't sit still, they can't keep quiet. And after we're done, I said, what did you hear? And some of them said, the birds, sir, the birds were singing. I said, you know, they're singing every morning, but because we're so loud and busy, we don't hear them. So that intentional stillness, you know, and that thing of what do you, what's your morning ritual? How do we, before you leave the house to go to work and even, you know, us as lecturers, Nicole, in the morning before you step out, what do you do for Nicole? Worse, if you're tired, you know, and you had a long day every morning, what is your ritual that gets you ready? And how do you stay present to yourself and say, you know, I have to get some extra sleep. I have to go to bed early or I have to laugh. I have to go and do something that, that being conscious of that and constantly doing that is so important. And not just with COVID generally in for mental health, which is something I'm glad we're having more conversations about. Because I recently did a, an episode um, on my show, Fabian say I have a YouTube show, and my topic was Jamaica, that we're a nation in trauma, acting like we're not. We keep, and how we socialize is, you, you know, the water rises and you push it down so you can go on, because you have bills to pay and, and then it keeps, but every time it rises, it gets higher. So you push it down and then the next thing you know, you're drowning. And so we have to get better at for ourselves, but also even our kids, helping them articulate what are you feeling? Why are you angry? Why are you hitting your sister? You know, oh, you don't like that teacher, why? And then wait for them to answer and tell you why. So they get better at being present to, I'm upset, but I can navigate this. Because being angry doesn't mean I shut down. You know, and how do I complete what I have to do by being conscious about how I'm feeling? And when do I know that, you know, I really can't do this, I, I'm running on empty. So getting better at gauging ourselves, taking care of ourselves, and being very, very clear that I can't constantly be giving. I have to, as you said, pour into myself so I can give. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. I have a question here from Sandrine Jackson Douglas. She stated, and quote, Dr. Watts, given the pattern and similarities between COVID-19 and influenza, do you think the world should brace for another flare-up? Uh, thanks for that question, Sandrine. Yes, that is normally the, um, a custom trend. Um, most scientists expect that several strains, we have not captured all of the strains of influenza or the coronavirus, and yes, they do expect um, further strains to emerge that we are not able to deal with, or, or meaning our immune systems are not able to deal with. So yes, it's expected that we should expect another flare-up. Whether another wave, I'm not sure. Um, the Spanish, the Spanish flu went through several waves. Three, um, one, the final one, somewhat of a wave. Um, that's the wave that affected the Caribbean in particular. Um, so, once these viruses emerge, once they emerge, then after a while, we do develop some form of resistance to it, and then once a new strain emerges, then we have to deal with it yet again. So yes. Uh, that is normally the trajectory that is taken. So the next outbreak might take place in the next 20 years, the next 10 years. But when you look at our last major pandemic worldwide or globally, it was the H1N1. And that, that killed over 500,000, but it didn't get as much attention because of the, because I don't think social media was as active as it is now. So I'm not sure if that's the, re that, that's the reason why it didn't get as much attention. Um, so it depends on the, the thing. Um, it depends. It just depends on the time. But we do know that many of them are originating in Asia because if you read Alfred Crosby's work, he's saying that um, even with even though it is said that the Spanish flu originated in America, um, it is likely that is because some Chinese workers who came to work on the railway then they came with some disease, some flu from Asia, and then so on, so on, so forth. So it depends on what Asia is up to, and then. So yes, we see. So Asia seems to be the, the main source of these uh, major pandemics, especially the respiratory ones, the influenza and the coronavirus. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Um, I think it was said 
in the past for MERS and SARS and H1N1 that there was some kind of um, coordinated international effort to mitigate these diseases, um, that there's there quite a few things were happening at court of calls and so on, but I am, I am not a research expert in this area. But that's what's said. Now, another thing that I wanted, um, I guess this is a final question, and this is also for you, Dr. Watts. Um, how can we, uh, one of the things I'm realizing is that individuals were relying on social media to share information, but there can be a disconnect between um, people who are on Twitter and Instagram and just the everyday ordinary person who really doesn't follow um, social media. What can we do in terms of a public education program how can we reach these individuals? Because I have a feeling that we might have to use some of that old technology to do that. Any tips? Well, in terms of transmission, um, you have to get people media literate and accustomed to the trends. Um, I think we did a fairly good job during the COVID-19 epidemic in terms of transmitting information. Uh, I think that with most Jamaicans, you have to find a way to to, uh, not not scare them, but uh, because I saw some advertisements that had some effect that they said the difference between death and um, life is six feet or something something um, as dramatic as that. So I don't know if I think we did a fairly good job. I mean, I saw wholeness up and down. Uh, not wholeness, but the the, um, the the vehicle that was transmitting his message about stay at home, stay at home. So it was repeated over and over and over. To the point where we got it we eventually got the message the, the, the enforce quarantine measures and so on and so forth so yes information is going to be crucial in terms of how we circulate it the traditional methods um that depends on us um, becoming you know people more being more accustomed to the traditions of reading and taking your time to process information and so on and so forth um, but this generation is more about the visual impact that you can generate the shock factor that you can generate um, as well, um, because I was watching a video recently about from Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, yes, um, on bodybuilding and so on, and he was saying that in terms of in terms of building muscle, right? Um, so it's, you know, how do you get the body um, to not get accustomed to the, the usual, get accustomed to the, the regular routine of exercising? You won't be testing it. You have to shock the muscle. So instead of doing ten um, push-ups, you do fifty. Or something of that nature, right? So you shock the muscle. So in, in terms of how we spread information and get people aware, especially this generation, you have to shock them in a certain way. Not shock in terms of um, you know misrepresent, but you shock them. You go very, you go out very hard and strong in terms of spreading the message using old and new methods. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Watts. So we've come to an end of our presentations and question and answer section. I just want to give, a pause to give thanks. A special thank you to you, our viewers, for tuning in today. I want to thank our main presenters, Dr. Watts and Professor Robertson for providing our brains with food for thought and hope that we apply the lessons from past pandemics. Mr. Thomas, I can already begin to feel the stress from COVID-19 departing from my body. Thanks for your very helpful and instructive presentation. A very big thank you to the technical team, Mr. Ishmael Preston, Mr. Andre Forbes, and the rest of the crew at Mona Information Technology Service, otherwise called MIX. Thanks to Ms. Janet Carew on the UE TV for all their assistance. I'm grateful to Ms. Michaela Hutchinson, who did a fantastic job moderating the chat. Join us tomorrow on YouTube, Yui Mona Media at 2 p.m. for the seminar, Media Literacy and Fake News in the COVID Era. Our presenters include Mr. Mark Jeffrey Deans, Mr. Amitab Sharma, and Dr. Renee Nelson. For more information, follow the faculty's Instagram page at humanities underscore education education underscore Mona, or send us an email at fhe at uimona.edu.jm. Thanks for tuning in and have a great evening, everyone.